Hello and welcome to this Surgery 101 video on an approach to pediatric bowel obstruction. This is Alessia Gallipoli, a fourth year medical student from Queen's University, and this video was put together with the help of the Surgery 101 team and Dr. Brian Dickin as an introduction to the broad differential diagnosis of bowel obstruction in pediatric patients. Let's go through an outline for this video. We'll start by describing the assessment of a child that presents with symptoms of a bowel obstruction. Then we'll list some common causes of bowel obstruction in different age groups. And finally, we'll go through an approach to help you narrow down your diagnosis. In bowel obstruction, there is a complete or partial obstruction of the bowel, meaning that material cannot pass through. This can be mechanical, where the lumen of the bowel is blocked by something in the way, or functional, where there is a disruption in how the bowel itself should normally work. Let's start by going through an approach to a child that presents to you with what you think might be a bowel obstruction. We can get a lot of information just from the child's general appearance. First off, how old do they? This is important to know because the causes of bowel obstruction can differ with the age presentation. Are they visibly toxic appearing or have symptoms that you think need immediate intervention? Next, we can move on to history. Are there any significant points on the pregnancy, birth, and developmental history? This can help you to identify a congenital versus an acquired cause of obstruction. Are there any additional health concerns or syndromes in the patient? This could also include any relevant family history. Your review of systems should of course include asking about general symptoms, including signs of infection. But let's focus on some important abdominal questions to ask. A detailed stooling history is key. Has there been any history of diarrhea? Has it ever been bloody? And has there been a normal stool pattern? Have there been episodes of abdominal pain? This could be either from the child describing pain or from looking for the signs in an infant. Does this pain seem to be chronic or colicky? And are there any triggers? Importantly, has there been any vomiting? If there has, what does the vomit look like? Does it ever appear green or bile colored? Is it ever bloody? Is the timing of the vomiting associated with feeds? And does the vomit ever shoot across the room? Let's move on next to the physical exam. A complete physical should of course be performed, but let's look at some specific areas to highlight when considering an obstructive differential. First, we want to look for any signs of dehydration or any concerns with growth and weight gain. A thorough examination of the abdomen is key. Does it appear distended? The degree of distension can help to give you an idea of how proximal or distal the obstruction might be. Are bowel sounds present? Are they hyperactive? Or can you not hear any bowel sounds at all? Are there evidence of any peritoneal or infectious signs? Is there any tenderness to palpation? If so, is it localized? Are there any palpable masses or any visible hernias? If you do notice a hernia, is it reducible? It's also important to examine the genitalia. Is there a normal appearing genitalia? Is there a patent anus? What are some red flags on history and physical that should make you think of an obstructive picture? These include bilious or projectile vomiting, abdominal distension, visible peristalsis, blood in the stool, absent bowel sounds, or failure to pass stool or gas at all. Imaging will depend on the specific bowel obstruction that you are thinking of, but may include a plain abdominal x-ray, ultrasound, upper GI barium study, barium enema, or a CT scan. Next, let's look at some common causes of bowel obstruction in children by the ages that you can typically see them presenting at. We can start with newborns in the first month of life. Pyloric stenosis is caused by a thickening of the pylorus, which prevents food from moving from the stomach into the duodenum. It is most common in the first two to eight weeks of life and most present under six months. It typically presents with non-bilious projectile vomiting and an olive-like epigastric mass that can be felt on palpation. Intestinal atresias are congenital blockages caused by failure of development of a portion of the intestinal tract. They can be picked up prenatally by ultrasound showing polyhydraminose or a dilated bowel. They are often associated with other conditions, including trisomy 21 and cystic fibrosis. A volvulus is a condition that can stem from a malrotation of the bowel, a fetal anomaly where the midgut rotates in the opposite way of normal around the mesenteric arteries. A volvulus can develop if the bowel is able to twist around parts of the mesentery, which can obstruct blood flow to the bowel and cause necrosis of intestinal tissue. 
a volvulus can also present in older infants or children. Emiconium ileus is an obstruction caused in the ileum by accumulation of meconium that is thicker in consistency than normal. It is usually associated with cystic fibrosis. Hirschsprung's disease is a lack of development of ganglion cells in the intestine and colon that leads to difficulties in passing stool. Definitive diagnosis is by biopsy to look for presence of ganglion cells in the tissue. Complications can include enterocolitis if not treated. Next, let's look at some conditions that can present a little bit later on in an infant's life. Intestaception occurs when one segment of intestine moves into the lumen of a downstream portion. It is the most common cause of intestinal obstruction in children under 2 and peaks between 4 and 10 months. Boys are more likely to be affected than girls. Serious complications can include ischemia, perforation, and peritonitis. It classically presents with colicky abdominal pain and episodes of red jelly stool. An incarcerated hernia can occur when bowel components of a hernia get trapped in the opening and cannot move back into the abdomen. This usually presents as a bulge that is painful, firm, and can be discolored. It can cause strangulation of the bowel as blood supply is cut off. Incarcerated hernias can also present in older children. When considering causes for bowel obstruction in an older child, as well as in a child of any age, it is important also to consider post-operative obstructions. These adhesive obstructions can occur after abdominal surgery and should be looked out for as a child recovers from surgery and should be considered in a child with a surgical history. Now that we've learned about some of the common causes of bowel obstruction in children, let's look at an approach that you can use to help to narrow down your diagnosis. The majority of children with a bowel obstruction will present with vomiting, and the details of this vomiting can help you to narrow down what type of obstruction you might be looking at. Non-bilious vomiting is a classic presentation for pyloric stenosis. Remember, this vomiting is also typically projectile. A few obstructions can present with either bilious or non-bilious vomiting. This includes intestinal atresias, where the characteristics of the vomiting can also give you some information about where in the bowel the atresia might be occurring. Intestception can also present with bilious or non-bilious vomiting, depending on where the area of intestception is along the bowel. The remainder of the causes of bowel obstruction that we talked about typically present with bilious vomiting. This includes a volvulus, which should be top on your list of concerns for an infant presenting with bilious vomiting. Other typically bilious causes of obstruction include meconium ileus, Hirschsprung's disease, an incarcerated hernia, and post-operative obstruction. Let's wrap up by summarizing what we discussed in this video. Bowel obstructions in children can have a very broad differential diagnosis. They can also have serious complications, so are important to pick up. A detailed abdominal history and physical is key. The child's age can tell you a lot about the type of obstruction you might be looking at. Vomiting is an important symptom in bowel obstruction, and the type of vomiting can help you to further narrow down your diagnosis. Thank you for watching, and I hope this video was helpful in introducing you to an approach to pediatric bowel obstructions.